to the World War II newspaper channel where we read the Chicago Tribune one day at a time, going through World War II as it happened through the eyes of those who lived it. If you enjoy content like this, please subscribe to this channel and click on the bell icon to get notifications when a new upload is going to premiere. And also, if you want to hear the actual newsmakers, go check out my other channel, the companion channel to this one, the World War II Old Time Radio channel. There we have vintage broadcasts, including newscasts, speeches, old movies, and music. And subscribe to that channel and click on the bell icon. Now for the newspaper. News as read from the Chicago Tribune for Monday, January 13th, 1941. The weather today. The sun rose at 7.16 a.m. It set at 4.43 p.m. For Chicago and vicinity, partly cloudy to cloudy. Light rain or snow beginning at night on Monday. Tuesday, cloudy and much colder. Light to moderate snow. Gentle to moderate north to northeast winds on Monday. The low temperature, 29 degrees. The high temperature, 43. Today's headline, Act to Limit FDR Power. Protests mounted yesterday against President Roosevelt's bill for increased powers and aid to Great Britain. At the same time, the head of the leading war interventionist or or organization in this country frankly declared that its purpose was to help the British even at the risk of war. The developments. Number one, Senator Burton K. Wheeler, Democrat Montana, charged in radio speeches in Washington, D.C. that the Roosevelt Bill, if passed, means war and an American dictatorship. Number two, Senator Henrik Shipstead, Republican Minnesota, warned in a message from Washington that the nation is now at the crossroads so far as war is concerned and riddled the assertion that the United States cannot defend itself and depends upon Britain for safety. Number three, officials of the Church League of America in Chicago called upon clergymen to oppose granting the president powers that were termed dictatorial and branded the bill probably the most dangerous ever put forward as an administration measure. Number four, Alf M. Landon in Topeka, Kansas, said that President Roosevelt would not have been elected if he had disclosed his views before the election and rebuked Wendell L. Wilkie for endorsing the bill. Number five, Ernest W. Gibson, new national chairman of the Committee to Defend America by Aiding the Allies, frankly admitted in New York that his organization knows it is risking sending the nation to war. And number six, Congressman James E. Van Zant, Republican Pennsylvania, warned in a Boston speech that what Britain wants most is American manpower. Washington, D.C., January 12th. Senator Burton K. Wheeler, Democrat Montana, warned in two radio addresses today that President Roosevelt's aid to Britain bill means war and the establishment of an American dictatorship. Senator Wheeler, an outstanding non-interventionist, said in an American forum of the air speech broadcast tonight by the Mutual Broadcasting System, if the American people want a dictatorship, if they want a totalitarian form of government, and if they want war, this bill should be Uh, steamrolled through Congress, as is the want of the president. Approval of this legislation means war, open and complete warfare. Therefore, I ask the American people before they supinely accept it, was the last war worthwhile? This bill is the New Deal's triple-A foreign policy, plow under every fourth American boy. The senator replied to President Roosevelt's assertion that the British would repay the United States. The repayment, said Senator Wheeler, probably will come in cries of Uncle Shylock. Our boys will be returned, returned in caskets, maybe. Senator Wheeler said the American people have never asked or compelled to give so completely their tax dollars to any foreign nation. Never before, he continued, has the Congress of the United States been asked by any president to violate international law. Never before has the Congress coldly and flatly been asked to abdicate. John John T. Flynn, national chairman of the Keep America Out of War Congress, speaking on the same program, ridiculed the belief that Hitler can invade America. He said the invasion fear is the work of British propagandists. 
Senator Josh Lee, Democrat, Oklahoma, and Herbert Agar, Louisville, Kentucky, editor, upheld the bill. Senator Wheeler spoke here earlier on the University of Chicago Roundtable program. If you follow the president's program, he said, it means in my judgment that you are not only going to denude the Army and the Navy, you are giving him dictatorial powers. I am opposed to giving him a blank check, and I am opposed to giving him dictatorial powers, and I am opposed to this country's going country going into the war to help England. Ralph Ingersoll, New York editor, took issue with the senator. With American help for England, he said, with more bombing planes and more bombs, we can cause enough damage to the industrial system in Germany to break up that empire which is just beginning to set. It is like concrete that has just been poured. Washington, D.C., January 12th. Senate opponents of President Roosevelt's War Powers Bill are forming their lines for a momentous battle in which they will take the position that the hour is at hand for Congress and the people to choose between peace and war and between dictatorship and the American form of government. Opposition leaders assert that granting of Mr. Roosevelt's request for unlimited power over the nation's armament and material resources to be used for the aid of any favored belligerent on such terms as he might devise would plunge the United States into war, even though it would not result in immediate full participation in the war with men and ships as well as material resources. Resistance in Congress would be at an end and Mr. Roosevelt would take the final step at will, according to the opposition. The decisive battle is expected to be fought in the Senate, where a move already is underway to revise and modify the bill. Opposition in the House is considered less effective because, under the rules there, a bare majority can force it through that body by st uh, steamroller methods before opposition from the country has time to make itself felt. In the Senate, where there is unlimited debate, the opposition is counting upon an uprising of popular indignation, such as the tidal wave of condemnation, which helped defeat Mr. Roosevelt's scheme to pack the Supreme Court in 1937. The first test of House sentiment on the bill will, will come tomorrow when Representative Andrew J. May, Democrat Kentucky, Chairman of the Military Affairs Committee, will demand that the measure be transferred to his committee from the Foreign Affairs Committee, to which it was referred by Speaker Sam Rayburn. May's motion is expected to result in a roll call vote. Representative Saul Bloom, Democrat New York, Chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee, professes confidence that May's motion will be defeated and has scheduled hearings on the bill for Tuesday. The Senate Foreign Relations Committee will take up the bill on Wednesday and is expected to begin hearings on Thursday. Present indications are that the bill will be rewritten and drastically modified by the Senate. There is general agreement that the legislation to increase aid to Great Britain and the other countries fighting the Axis powers will be passed. In fact, there is vir virtually no opposition to all possible aid to Britain within two limitations. Number one, that the United States shall not become a co-belligerent. And number two, that the Army and Navy shall not be stripped of the minimum requirements of this country's own defense. New York, January 12th. Wendell L. Wilkie declared today he favored with modification President Roosevelt's Lend-Lease Arms Bill and announced he would fly soon to England for a private survey of the international situation. He asserted the bill should grant powers to the president for a fixed term not too far in the future and that Congress should not be harried in its passage. The defeated Republican presidential candidate expressed the belief the nation faced an emergency under which extraordinary powers must be granted to the elected executive. Concerning his trip abroad, Wilkie made it clear that he would go solely as a private citizen and said he sought personal contact with the situation abroad, just as I did when I was practicing law and wanted to know the facts of the case. Infer inferentially, Wilkie took exception to Alf M. Landon's recent statement on British-American relations with the words, I refute the sentiment that our national security is not involved in a British defeat. The difference between a British defeat or victory is not only military, but economic. Topeka, Kansas, January 12th. Alf M. Landon commenting on Wendell Wilkie's modified approval of President Roosevelt's Lend-Lease Arms Bill tonight said if Mr. Wilkie had revealed that to be his 
to be his position before the Republican National Convention, he would not have been nominated. Wilkie's position is essentially the same as Mr. Roosevelt's, the 1936 Republican presidential nominee said. That is, we must get into the war if necessary to help England win. If Mr. Roosevelt had revealed that to be his position before the election, he would not have been re-elected. Landon was head of the Kansas delegation at the GOP National Convention in Philadelphia last June and helped swing the state's 18 votes to Wilkie on a crucial ballot. The former Kansas governor said in a speech at Tulsa last night that the president had committed himself to a war policy and urged that American ships be kept out of war zones. Senator Henrik Shipstead, Republican Minnesota, repudiated the sub- suggestion that the United States, the most powerful nation in the world, cannot defend itself and its independent and is dependent upon England for its safety. Senator Shipstead, a member of the Foreign Relations Committee, expressed his views in a letter to a group of Minneapolis and St. Paul interventionists who had protested his opposition to the foreign policy of the Roosevelt administration. If we have fallen to such a low estate, if we have reached a point where we must ask another nation to, to do our fighting for us, then we are unworthy of the freedom we, we possess, Shipstead wrote. However, if it be true that Britain is fighting our battle, then this country should, in all honesty, declare war on Germany and her allies. Expressing opposition to President Roosevelt's new war powers bill, the Minnesota senator declared, We have now before Congress a bill which, if passed, will become a blank check upon the entire resources of our country to guarantee the military victory of one of the belligerents. If we take that fateful step, it is not logical to believe that we must take another and become active participants in an undeclared war or in a war declared upon us by one or more of the belligerents. This country now stands, Senator Shipstead declared, at the crossroads that lead to foreign wars or retention of the traditional American policy, just as it stood in 1917. The country is faced with this decision, he said. I am opposed to sending our young men to die on the battlefields of Europe, Asia, or Africa. I am opposed to taking any step which may lead to that tragic result, he said. The senator said that he favored a strong army, navy, and air force to defend the Monroe Doctrine on the western continent, however. Senator Gerald P. Nye, Republican North Dakota, told reporters he would fight the bill. Make no mistake about it, he said. This is the last ditch. This is a last ditch fight. This is our last fight before the question of war itself is raised. If we lose it, war is almost inevitable. New York, January 12th. Labeling the Lend Lease Bill before Congress an astonished an astounding proposal calculated to give President Roosevelt the sole war making authority and power, Vern Marshall, chairman of the No Foreign War Committee tonight called on the people of the country, housewives, farmers, workers, small businessmen, to demand of their representatives in Washington that they give not one whit more of authority to the president. If Congress decides to pass the bill, Marshall said, your liberties and mine are on their way to oblivion. That bill, Marshall went on, appears to be a bid for exactly such totalitarian and dictatorial authority as incenses Mr. Roosevelt when he speaks so vehemently against the exercise by leaders of foreign governments. Marshall spoke from the local studios of station WOR, Eastern Outlet of the Mutual Broadcasting System, instead of from the Lost Battalion Hall uh, uh, in uh, Queensboro as originally planned, because he said he had learned an attempt would be made to disorganize the scheduled meeting. Officers of the Church League of America, 53 West Jackson Boulevard, issued a strong statement of protest yesterday in the league's name against the president's aid to Britain bill. The statement was signed by Frank J. Loesch, the league's general chairman, from whose apartment in the Drake Hotel it was issued. George W. Robnett, secretary, and Dr. Almer M. Pennewell of St. John's Methodist Church, the league's clergy chairman. These leaders termed the bill dictatorial and urged clergymen to demand that Congress refuse to grant the president's bid for unlimited power. Robnett said copies of the statement will be forwarded to the thousands of clergymen on the league's list. New York, January 12th. 
Former Senator Ernest W. Gibson of Vermont, new national chairman of the Committee to Defend America by Aiding the Allies, defined the committee's objective today as all possible material aid to the Allies, but he frankly declared it involved the risk of going to war. In his first press conference since succeeding William Allen White, Emporia, Kansas editor, as the committee's leader, Gibson asserted this is no time for a faint heart. White resigned recently and charged the committee's membership including men, included many warmongers. Last night, the Right Reverend Frank E. Wilson, Bishop of the Episcopal Diocese of Eau Claire, Wisconsin, withdrew permission for the committee to use his name on its letterhead. As I see it, the 39-year-old Gibson said, the only chance the democracies have for peace is to keep those fighting for democracy supplied now, and if that isn't sufficient, then it looks like we will get into the war. And now for world news. Belgrade, Yugoslavia, January 12th. The capture by Greek soldiers of the mountain village of Tepelini, which the Greeks claimed meant a definite break of the whole Italian front in central Albania, was reported tonight in Yugoslav border advices. There was no confirmation of the report in Athens, although the town's capture had been accepted. The frontier report said Tepelini fell with hardly any fascist resistance and that the main Italian army was fleeing to the mountains northwest of town. The fall of Tepelini, if verified, means the Greeks have achieved the object of a two-pronged offensive against Tepelini and Klesura, 10 miles eastward of Tepelini. Klesura was captured Friday by Greek forces. Tepelini is 55 miles south of the important fascist port of Valona on the Adriatic Sea and is connected with that city by a highway built by the Italians during the World War. Athens, January 12th. Italian, Italian troops driven out of Klesura continued their northward retreat tonight with the Greeks in close pursuit, it was reported here. There was no confirmation that the Greeks had captured Tepelini. Reports from the Albanian front said Greek planes again machine gunned the fleeing Italian column. In the coastal sector, the Greeks made further advances uh, toward Valona despite desperate fascist resistance, it was said. The government spokesman gave this picture of the fighting. Despite difficulties of terrain, our units continued their attack successfully and drew back the enemy from fortified positions, which he was holding after extremely rapid action, which took the Italians by surprise. The Italian retreat was so quick, the enemy had no time to take away materials and suffered heavy losses, leaving 40 dead. Cairo, Egypt, January 12th. Fresh British guns hauled across the Libyan sands joined the shelling of the besieged Italian seaport base of Torbrook tonight under the constant protection of British aviators who reported Italian planes have been chased from five air bases in eastern Libya. The new artillery came 70 miles from the Bardia region where it had played a major role in softening Italian defenses for the final British-Australian attack on that captured fascist base. Tobruk, with a garrison believed smaller than the nearly 45,000 troops who were killed, wounded, or captured in Bardia, has been caught in a ring of British steel for five days with the defenders' retreat cut off. British military observers say now that Marshal Rodolfo Graziani, Italian commander in Libya, must fight in the future without his air eyes as the Royal Air Force, they declare, has seized command of the air. An RAF communique told of more attacks on the Italians in Libya and a raid by the fleet air arm on Palermo on Sicily's northern coast. The RAF said fighters maintaining a constant patrol in eastern Libya reported Derna, Martuba, Tamini, and Gazala were all clear of enemy aircraft except for a considerable, a considerable number that were unserviceable and that the the Bamba seaplane base between Tobruk and Derna appears to have been abandoned by the enemy. In Palermo, uh, in the Palermo raid, the RAF reported shipping was the main objective. One bomb fell very close to a merchant vessel, about 8,000 tons, it said. The RAF also raided Benina and Burka airdromes again and told of bombs straddling buildings. Rome, January 12th. The Italian High Command today said that the British made repeated raids against Italian bases in Libya, which were not otherwise identified. It said artillery dueling and patrol clashes had occurred in the East African theater of war. 
Rome, January 12th. In the continuing German-Italian offensive against Britain's naval might in the Mediterranean, the Italian High Command re today reported that four more British warships, two cruisers, and two destroyers had been hit. One of two Italian torpedo boats which attacked an imposing array of British warships was sunk, the Italian said, but their torpedoes left the cruiser in a sinking condition and two destroyers with fires aboard. The second of the two cruisers reported hit was the 5th British warship struck from the air in two days and was marked up as a German score. It was said to have been one of Britain's 9,100-ton Birmingham class. Units of the German Air Corps, the communique said, continuing the brilliant action begun yesterday, carried out a scouting offensive against English squadrons. Two important groups of warships were attacked. One cruiser of the Birmingham type was hit for certain with a heavy bomb. The German High Command said one cruiser and several other warships suffered heavy bomb hits during a repeat attack on a British flotilla in the Mediterranean. Two aircraft carriers, a cruiser and a destroyer, were reported hit either by bombs or aerial torpedoes in the earlier plane attack delivered Friday by Italian and German craft in the Sicilian Channel. The battle between surface forces was placed Friday in the Straits of Sicily. The communique said it began with a patrol of two torpedo boats sighted an important enemy naval formation composed of numerous surface units at dawn. It said the torpedo boats attacked the center of the line de uh, determinedly, hitting with two torpedoes, one cruiser later seen sinking. A hot fight followed. It continued between enemy destroyers supported by cruisers and our torpedo boats, which engaged them in long, intense firing, during which fires were visible aboard two enemy destroyers. One of our torpedo boats was sunk. The other went immediately to the scene of the sinking to save the crew. A new overnight British air raid on the northern Italian industrial city of Turin and also of Savigliano was acknowledged uh, at Turin, it was said some civilian factories were hit, three persons were killed, and four wounded. At Savigliano, a, boy, that's tough, a military hospital, some dwellings, and a parochial church were damaged, but there were no casualties. In London, the British Air Ministry announced that a small force of RAF bombers attacked Turin and scored direct hits on the Royal Arsenal. New York, January 12th. The British Broadcasting Corporation said today two French Air Force officers had deserted to the Free French Forces of General Charles de Gaulle in an airplane of the Italian Peace Commission. The Frenchmen were reported to have left Iran, Algeria on December 3rd and flown to North Africa. London, January 12th. The Nazi Air Force made another attempt to burn London tonight, showering down high explosives and incendiary bombs on certain districts. Hundreds of regular firemen and auxiliary fire servicemen, aided by hundreds of civilians, risked their lives to prevent the, fire, the spread of the flames. Great numbers of planes passed over the city at intervals. Reports said scores of Nazi planes were turned back at the Thames estuary and jettisoned their loads in the marshes under the anti-aircraft fire. The raiders began coming over early in the evening while the capital still was clearing away the debris of Saturday night's four-hour raid. As on Saturday night, the all-clear sounded after the attack had lasted about four hours. Some time after the London siren sounded, British fighter planes were heard circling overhead, indicating that a night combat force was taking the air against the Raiders. German planes also were reported over Liverpool and a town in northeast England. Relays of bombers roared across the south coast and were reported to have fanned out for attacks as far as western England. A southwest town was reported attacked for some hours. The Royal Air Force blasted at German-occupied invasion forts, ports and airdromes in France and attacked objectives in northern Italy during the night, an authoritative source said. Air alarms had been reported in Switzerland, often an indication of British flights to and from Italy. The Royal Air Force issued a communique announcing wide Saturday daylight raids on the Dutch and Belgian coast with bomb damage to barges in a canal in the Middle Harness and hits on the Mole at Zeebrugge. 
Portsmouth, England, January 12th. Soldiers, sailors, and civilians of this Navy town spent the weekend digging victims from buildings blasted by Friday night's heavy air attack. Berlin, January 12th. Military objectives in London and other British cities were subjected to a heavy German air bombardment tonight, informed sources said. Earlier in the day, three British hurricane planes attempting to fly into northern France in the region between Calais and Boulogne were shot down, they said. A 3,000-ton merchant vessel was reported sunk at, at the mouth of the Humber River by a German bomber who said he also scored direct hits on buildings and destroyed a British airport at Ramsgate. New York, January 12th. A Domai Japanese news agency broadcast heard here tonight said Japanese forces encountered 36,000 Chinese troops in Shanxi province last month, killed 2,989, and took 721 prisoners. It said seized material included 1,500 rifles, other arms, ammunition, and about 21,890 bushels of cereals. Bangkok, Thailand, January 12th. The Thai High Command reported today that fierce fighting was developing in the French Indochinese province of Cambodia, which Thai troops invaded in force last week. The communique said the advance continued steadily with effective cooperation of the Air Force, but gave no place names or details. Heavy artillery fire was reported along the Mekong River, which separates Indochina's Laos province from Siam. The Bangkok radio answering the Saigon's radio suggestion that France was prepared to negotiate a settlement of the frontier dispute in which Thailand is pressing an old territorial claim, said Thailand always is ready for negotiations. Ankara, Turkey, January 12th. British Army, Air Force and Naval officers were assembling here today for exchanges of views with the Turkish general staff, one of a series of such conferences. This will be the first such conference since the French defeat. London, January 12th. Ronald Tree, Parliamentary Secretary to the Ministry of Information and Member of Parliament from the Harborough Division of Leicestershire, told his constituents tonight he would go to the United States soon. He did not divulge the purpose of his trip. Ruse, Bulgaria, January 12th. Premier Bogdan Filov told his people tonight that they might yet be brought into the war, but said he was sure they would not forgive anybody who tried to make Bulgaria National Socialist or Nazi, Communist or Fascist. In a speech at this frontier town just across the Danube from Romania, where hundreds of thousands of German soldiers are massed, the Premier avoided reference to reports abroad of German pressure on Bulgaria, but said specifically that Bulgaria wants to follow her own traditions. National socialism, fascism, and communism may be good for Germany, Italy, and Russia, he said, but they cannot be transplanted to Bulgarian soil, he declared. President Roosevelt's recent statement, he said, reflect the dangers of the present gigantic battle, which threatens to go around the whole world. President Roosevelt's message to Congress, he went on, unquestionably is an indication of a long war that is likely to spread to other parts of the world. The aims of Bulgarian foreign policy, Filov said, are to guard the people from the terror of war and in general to keep Bulgaria and all the Balkans at peace. But he added, to keep the peace does not depend on Bulgaria. We must realize that one day we may have to enter the war. The people must be prepared to defend their vital interests. Filoff said the army is better equipped than in the last war. Moscow, January 12th. Russia has not consented to any passage of German troops into Bulgaria, nor has she been informed of such a move if it has occurred. It was announced officially late tonight. A special communique distributed by TASS, official news agency, was broadcast by the Moscow radio an hour ahead of the usual news bulletin. The TASS statement in denial of foreign press reports asserted Germany never has asked Russia's consent to the entrance of German soldiers into Bulgaria, into Bulgaria and Bulgaria never has approached Russia with an inquiry regarding the passage of German troops through her borders. A similar communique was issued at the time of the entry of the Germans into Romania last fall. Russia and Bulgaria traditionally have maintained close and friendly relations. 
Chung King, January 12th, an agreement on the third part of a Chinese-Soviet-Russian pact providing for the exchange of Chinese materials for Russian military machinery and supplies was reported today by Xiao Tang Po, Chinese Army newspaper. It said goods exchanged would amount to the equivalent of 100 million United States dollars. The second part of the agreement, reported on January 3rd, was said to have involved exchange of Chinese wool for Russian supplies. The first part, providing for an exchange of Chinese tea for Russian material, was announced on December 11th. Vichy, France, January 12th. French newspapers today devoted considerable attention to President Roosevelt's plan for lending and leasing war materials to England and asserted that the proposal finds its counterbalance in a new economic pact just signed between Russia and Germany. What is France's position in this and uh, in this give and take of international politics? The question is raised and the answer suggested is that France is for France and that may be a signpost for Admiral William D. Leahy, American ambassador. Today's attempts in an article on American armaments characterized President Roosevelt's fears for American safety as lacking in a sense of reality. The Claremont Ferrand newspaper, Avenir, pictured international politics as a tug of war between London, backed by Washington, and Berlin, backed by Moscow, with the Japanese in the offing. In this tug of war, the French wonder what their position must be. Avenir said, uh, Avenir said France has no idea of intervening, intervening in the maneuvers of states. France is only thinking of overhauling its political and social machinery and preserving the integrity of its colonial empire, which guarantees its future rehabilitation. The radiating strength of France is still intact in the prestige that a military defeat has not obliterated, and it is reflected in the fact that our colonial conquests have never brought servility but rather resulted in subsequent understandings and friendships. President Roosevelt, in his New New Year message to Chief of State Pétain, wished that France would again soon be enjoying liberty, equality, and fraternity. The Pétain government, however, now frowns on such a formula and has replaced it with what it considers a more fitting one, labor, family, and country. Stockholm, Sweden, January 12th. The newspapers of Oslo, Norway, will carry an appeal to all national Norwegians by Vidkun Quisling tomorrow to form a regiment to fight against England. The regiment, Quisling's statement will say, will be formed in Germany under the name of Regiment Nordland. Uh, Quisling himself, informed sources said, probably would be chief of the volunteers. Mexico City, January 12th. Conservative revision of much of the basic legislation adopted during the Cardenas administration will be approved in February special session of Congress, legislative leaders predicted today. In calling the February session, President Manuel Avila Camacho made public a list of bills he will submit for enactment. Marked for revision were the General Law of Labor, the Civil Service Code, the Law of National Education, and the Law of Implementing Article 27 of the Constitution on Mexico's Rights of the Petroleum Subsoil. Port of Spain, Trinidad, January 12th. The American-British agreement on base sites in Trinidad generally was welcomed tonight by the press. United States Army engineers already have begun surveying the sites. London, January 12th. Sponsored by left-wing labor and communist leaders, 1,891 delegates representing, they said, more than 2 million workers held a People's Convention in London today. Slogans announced its purposes as, End the causes of war, government of the people, for the people, by the people, peace without annexation or indemnity, and power is in your hands. Learn to use it. Speakers warned that the government is attempting to buy out the labor leaders who have been urged to recommend the use of conscripted labor under a plan that would make it appear that labor is voluntary, voluntarily agreeing to submit to government dictatorship over the workers in order to speed up war production. 
the convention probably would not have attracted any more interest than a mammoth exhibition of soapbox oratory, except for the growing demand echoed even in the conservative press that Britain as well as Europe must adopt a new order when victory is won. Arthur Greenwood, powerful labor leader who has been named Minister for Post-War Construction, already has advanced the slogan, A Decent Life for All. He has told the press he is planning to extend state ownership to many industries, including coal, all forms of transportation, including railways, roads, canals, and coastal shipping, agriculture, gasoline and oil, and production of iron, steel, and building materials. Uh, Dennis N. Pritt, a member of parliament who was expelled from the Labour Party last March because he refused to join in condemnation of the invasion of Finland by Russia, presented eight points which the convention adopted. They provided, number one, a higher living standard for the people, including increased wages for civil and defense workers, dependents allowances, pensions, compensation insurance, and unemployment allowances. Uh, Number two, adequate air raid precautions, bomb-proof shelters, and effective provisions to supply all the needs of air raid victims. Number three, restoration safeguard and extension of trade union rights, including that to strike. Number four, emergency powers to be used to uh, take over banks, land transport, and large-scale industry to eliminate economic chaos, profiteering, and corruption, and to organize production in the interests of the people. Number five, freedom for India and the right for all colonial people to determine their own destiny and ending of the enforced partition of Ireland. Number six, friendship with Russia. Number seven, a truly representative people's government. Number eight, a people's peace achieved by working people of all the countries based on the rights of all peoples to determine their own destinies. Pritt told the the convention the people's peace would mean no annexations, no uh, uh, reparations, or no indemnities. Vichy, France, January 12th. Restricted passenger train schedules effective Wednesday were announced tonight because of a shortage of coal and lubricants. It was explained that available supplies must be conserved for indispensable freight traffic. Reports reaching Vichy from Paris said the inhabitants of the Nazi-occupied French capital have been restricted to registration at one butcher shop under a new rationing law aimed at increasing Parisians' food supplies. Officials, it was said, has have uh, promised to try to distribute meat as equally as possible among all shops. Berlin, January 12th. German housewives scan the advertising sections of their morning newspapers as eagerly as American housewives do. The Americans may study them for bargains in food or clothes for their families. The Germans look for the official notices announcing what foods may be obtained in their town in the coming weeks on their special ration cards, which supplement the regular meat, butter, bread, and sugar cards. This morning, Berliners found notices promising a special allotment of fruit and dried vegetables, which is welcome news in view of the shortages of vegetables and fruit of which the housewives have been complaining. How big the rations of dried vegetables will be was not revealed, but they were promised for March and April. In stores that sell vegetables and fruits, one can obtain potatoes, cabbage, and occasionally some carrots and red beets and loads of chicory. The chicory, a salad vegetable, must usually be prepared without oil, which is a rare treat. In extensive shopping around, in extensive shopping around Americans who wanted to bake a pumpkin pie found some cu- pumpkins in a fruit section of a department store. A sales girl warned that they were frozen and would not keep long. They cost 10 cents a pound, whereas pumpkins were plentiful last year at a cost of uh, not more than 3 cents a pound. Nevertheless, the 20-pound pumpkin, which cost $2, was carried off by in, in uh, triumph by the uh, purchaser. By using a month's ration of eggs for one person, which means two, she will be able to bake the pumpkin pie. She still has some spices in her pantry, otherwise she would be in a quandary because spices are hard to get. One can buy fancy little envelopes containing synthetic spices which are made to smell like cinnamon or some other spice. They do not come up to the mark, however, of the real product. Starting tomorrow, all holders of ration cards will be permitted to buy a pound of apples or pears and children less than 18 years old will be entitled to two pounds. The children also will get a pound of oranges or tangerines. 
Adults were promised a probable orange ration later. Jews receive none of these rations. Stockholm, Sweden, January 12th. Love, which has been known to laugh at locksmiths and circumventing immigration restrictions between German-occupied Norway and Sweden. Sources at Oslo, Norway, say a great many weddings are occurring along the Norwegian-Swedish border, with Norwegian girls standing just within the boundary of their Swedish sweethearts just over the line in Sweden. When a couple is pronounced husband and wife, the girl steps across the border as a Swedish citizen. Manila, Philippine Islands, January 13th. Father Louis Bogel, German Catholic priest at Subic, location of a United States naval base, was summoned today to appear before a deportation board January 20th to show cause why he should not be deported from the Philippine Islands as an undesirable alien. He was accused of having conducted, under the guise of religious teaching, propaganda in favor of totalitarian nations. Also, it is charged he emphasized the futility of resistance by small nations to peaceful overtures of strong nations. Tortosa, Spain, January 12th. Six persons were killed today in a train derailment between Alcanar and Viñaraz, bringing to 18 the total of dead and railroad accidents in Spain in the last three days. Johannesburg, Union of South Africa, January 13th. Sixteen members of the South African Air Force were killed when their plane crashed near uh, Mibinya, Tanganyika. It was announced officially today. It was believed the pilot lost his way in a thick mist and crashed into a mountainside. Istanbul, Turkey, January 12th. Earth shocks recurring in the past 48 hours in the Smyrna district have demolished a number of houses, but there have been no reports of casualties. Two severe tremors were also felt here yesterday, but no damage was recorded. San Jose, Costa Rica, January 12th. High winds and minor earth tremors disturbed Costa Rica today. Telephone and telegraph communications were interrupted in scattered areas. Zurich, Switzerland, January 13th. James Joyce, Irish author author whose Ulysses was the center of one of the most bitter literary controversies of modern times, died in a Zurich hospital early today despite the efforts of physicians to save him by, by blood transfusions. He would have been 59 years old on February 2nd. Joyce underwent an intestinal operation Saturday afternoon. For a time, he appeared to be recovering. Yesterday, his son reported him cheerful and apparently out of danger. In the afternoon, the writer suffered a relapse and sank rapidly. His wife and son were at the hospital when he died. Joyce was born in Dublin, was educated in Jesuit schools, and took his degree at Trinity College. He attained fluency in 10 languages and also was a student of medicine, which he intended to practice but never did. He was partially blind and did his writing in longhand, much of it painfully. He left Ireland in 1904, but returned to open Dublin's first movie house, which was unsuccessful. He went back to the continent and lived most of the time in Tristy, then in Austria-Hungary, Zurich had Zurich and Paris. Joyce's first novel, A Portrait of the Artist of a Young Man, appeared in 1916. Then came the essay, The Day of Rabblement, which criticized Ireland's literary aspirations and the Gaelic Renaissance movement. He began Ulysses in 1914 and took seven years to write it. It was published in Paris and immediately was banned in Dublin, London, and New York. Every book he wrote except one was banned from sale in some corner of the globe, most frequently in his homeland. The ban on Ulysses was lifted in the United States in 1933. Among his other works were were chamber music, poems, uh, poems, many of which were set to music, Dubliners, which was publicly burned in his native city, Exiles, Anna Livia, Pluribelli, and his last book, Finnegan's Wake. Hey guys, if you enjoy this channel, check out our companion channel to this one, the World War II Old Time Radio Channel. Over there, you will hear radio broadcasts of the newsmakers, the news reporters, and various entertainment programs, comedy, drama, horror, all kinds of fun stuff. And you will also get the number one song every Friday that is represented on that channel as the radio programs correspond with the newspapers that you hear. 
Each upload premieres the same night the newspaper premieres that you are uh, listening to right now. We even feature movie serials and classic movies on there when uh, YouTube permits it. So swing over to the World War II old-time radio channel and click on that bell icon to subscribe. And don't forget to subscribe to this channel as well and click on that bell icon. I know you'll enjoy them. And now back to national news. Hyde Park, New York, January 12th. President Roosevelt created a new government division of defense housing coordination today to help eliminate delays. He appointed Charles Palmer of Atlanta, Georgia, to the post of coordinator of the, the, of the division, which is a part of the Office of Emergency Management in the White House Executive Office. Defense housing problems have been handled by a unit in the commission of which Palmer has been in charge. White House, House officials said that a lack of authority had caused delays. In effect, Mr. Roosevelt has shifted the work from the defense commission to an agency under his immediate supervision. The executive order establishing the Division of Defense Housing Coordination provides that Palmer shall work with other government housing agencies, recommend coordinate, coordinated programs and facilities their execution or fa and facilitate their execution through private housing groups. New York, January 12th. Serious bottlenecks in shipping definitely are threatening the nation's preparedness program. They are even presenting important curbs on the Roosevelt administration's highly controversial plans to mold American resources into an arsenal for Britain because so many American ships already have been sold to Britain and because shipbuilding facilities presently can meet only a f fraction of projected needs. This was the finding of an exhaustive survey of the American shipping and construction situation disclosed here today. This study indicated that the United States Merchant Marine, a key industry, is actually dwindling despite the intensive efforts of the administration to step up American tonnage needs while at the same time trying to meet British requirements made more urgent by German sinkings of British craft. Official anxiety was expressed in Washington that a serious shortage may develop in shipping. Worry on the same score has been expressed by British officials hopeful of increasing demands on American ship tonnage. In the light of this expressed anxiety and the importance of the merchant marine, a survey of the industry was made with the aid of H.M. Wick, assistant to J. Lewis Luckenbach, who is president of the American Bureau of Shipping. The Merchant Marine, the survey showed, as a total of 1,251 ocean-going vessels of 2,000 gross tons or more, with an aggregate of 7,475,000 gross tons and 437 Great Lakes vessels of similar size, totaling 2,341,275 gross tons. The grand total is 1,688 vessels of 9,816,275 gross tons. These figures include all documented and registered ships of the Merchant Marine, whether privately owned or operated by the government, and whether laid up in idle status or in actual service on American trade routes. These figures are at are as of January 1st, 1941. Washington, D.C., January 12th. Septuagenarian Secretary of War Henry L. Stimson today announced creation of a committee of seven which will study problems pertaining to air raid, bomb shelters, water supply, and power, among others. Stimson asked Walter D. Binger of the American Society of Civil Engineers to be chairman. Other members, each representing a national engineering organization, are W.H. Carrier, Harry E. Jordan, A. B. Ray, Abel Waldman, James L. Walsh, and Scott Turner. Major Eugene W. Riddings of the War Department General Staff was designated to ask, act as the military contact member with the group. Washington, D.C., January 12th. The American Federation of Labor told Congress today that its members were ready to make sacrifices for national defense but would oppose any attempt to curtail labor's right to strike. It would be suicidal for us in our haste to build an invulnerable military defense of our country to abandon democracy in the process, the Federation said. The AFL said it would not oppose reasonable reductions in relief appropriations since defense jobs expansion was providing jobs. 
uh, at, uh, was providing jobs at such a rapid pace that it appears likely the number of unemployed will be reduced sharply by the end of the year. It estimated that there were now 8 million unemployed. It said it would oppose any move to impair present federal labor laws, but proposed amendments to the Labor Relations Act as safeguards against possible future maladministration. New York, January 12th. Clarence Hathaway, former editor of The Daily Worker and one of three top communist leaders in America, has been expelled from the party the National Committee revealed today. Hathaway was dropped as editor of the paper six months ago, but no public announcement was made of his dismissal. The official notice of the purge of the Red Leader said he had been expelled for failure to meet personal and political responsibilities assumed by him for desertion and for failing and refusing to take steps to rehabilitate himself. The National Committee said it had given Hathaway three months in which to clear himself, but that he had continued to default his obligations. Salt Lake City, Utah, January 12th. Fire destroyed United Airlines hangar uh, at the Municipal Airport tonight. Two large passenger planes and all mechanical and repair equipment. Damage was estimated at $300,000. The planes destroyed were a 10-passenger Boeing B-247B er, Boeing and a 21-passenger Douglas DC-3. Airline officials said they were valued at $155,000. Lost along with the hangar, the planes, and the shop equipment was a commissary built last year at a cost of $10,000. The fire, fed by gasoline, spread so quickly that there was no time for salvage. The cost was not learned. An 820-gallon gasoline tank truck exploding as the flames reached its sides added fuel to the blaze, as did gasoline of the planes themselves and of private cars parked nearby. New York, January 12th. Four square blocks of summer homes in the Avern section of Queens were leveled early today by a five-alarm fire that started in construction equipment where the Long Island Railroad is being elevated to eliminate grade crossings. The blaze sent showers of sparks over the area and high winds fanned the flames. More than 50 fire companies fought the fire. Most of the homes were unoccupied. About 100 families were driven from their homes on the fringe of the burning area. No one was injured so far as the police could ascertain. Palm Beach, Florida, January 12th. Caught by a heavy groundswell five miles north of Palm Beach, the United States liner Manhattan was carried aground tonight. Lying broadside to the beach three miles off Lake Worth Inlet with her bow afloat, the ship was not in any immediate danger. There was no explanation of why the Manhattan was so close to shore, but shipping men said that most southbound vessels came as close in as possible to avoid bucking the swift Gulf Stream. Captain G.V. Richardson, master of the liner, told Boatswain uh, Boatswain Earl Wallace, commander of the Coast Guard's Peanut Island Station, that the ship only needed to be pulled free to continue her voyage to California with about 250 cruise passengers and a crew of 500. Wallace and a crew went out in a small boat to be tr- to the trapped liner. Wallace said he did not believe the ship was damaged, but could not be certain until it was refloated. Reached on, pat- uh, on patrol duty off Miami, the cutter Mojave was summoned along with the vigilante from Port Pierce. The ship won aground 8 p.m. Chicago time. Minneapolis, Minnesota, January 12th. Charges that the Minnesota Art Project of the Federal Works Progress Administration has imposed financial hardship on independent artists and has curtailed their opportunities were made today by Mrs. Harriet Hanley, head of the Hanley Galleries. Many of the canvases turned out on the project, she said, are unworthy of designation as art and a few years back bore evidence of subversive propaganda. Independent artists have suffered, Mrs. Hanley said, because schools and other public buildings which once brought their work now get it for nothing from the WPA. Uh, Many on the WPA are not artists by any standard. And now for local and regional news. Springfield, Illinois, January 12th. 
Republicans will resume the control of government of Illinois tomorrow after eight years of Democratic management with the inauguration of Dwight H. Green, 44-year-old Chicago lawyer, as governor and the induction of four other members of the party into state offices. The ceremonies will take place in the spacious drill hall of the new armory before an audience of 6,000. Only one Democrat, Secretary of State Edward J. Hughes, will take the oath of office. Hughes, because of his personal popularity and the influence of the office he has held for two terms, was the sole Democrat to slide through under the GOP landslide last November 5th. Taking office with the governor will be these Republicans. Hugh W. Cross, Jerseyville Lieutenant Governor. George F. Barrett, Chicago Attorney General. Arthur C. Luter, Chicago Auditor of Public Accounts. And Warren Wright, Springfield State Treasurer. Green becomes either the 30th or 32nd governor of Illinois, depending on whether the three terms of Richard J. Oglesby are considered as separate administrations or as one. Oglesby's first administration began in 1865 at the close of the Civil War. He served during the Reconstruction period until 1869. He served again for a year in 1873 and for a second four-year term from 1885 to 1889. Green, his wife, and their young daughters, Nancy, 13 years old, and Gloria, 9, arrived in the Capitol tonight aboard a special train jammed with political figures and inaugural visitors. Crowds cheered as the family left their car. They will occupy a hotel suite for a few days before moving into the executive mansion, which is to be vacated by Governor John Stell and Mrs. Stell tomorrow. Green maintained silence on his choices for cabinet posts when he left Chicago yesterday on his way to Springfield. Green and Stell will occupy the first car in the pre-inaugural parade tomorrow morning. The procession will wind through the Springfield Business District around the Sagamon County Courthouse, which was the state capital when Abraham, Abraham Lincoln sat in the legislature, and thence to the armory where Chief Justice Walter T. Gunn of the Supreme Court will administer the oaths of office to the incoming officials. Custom requires that Green sit at Stell's left for the ride to the armory, but on the return trip to the mansion, their positions will be reversed. The same is, same is true of the other officials retiring and incoming. Hundreds of sections of draped bunting decorate the Great Hall of the Armory. By design or coincidence, the protective covering over the polished floor is colored green. Chairs to the number of 2,750 stand in ranks on the main floor. 2,550 others are in, per are in the permanent gallery setup and on the stage in front of a rich gold cur curtain are 238 places for the official inaugural party, their wives, and party dignitaries. These 238 chairs are in addition to the platform space reserved for the 115-piece University of Illinois Band, whose music has been an inaugural feature for many years. When the ceremonies have been concluded, workmen will remove the chairs and floor covering and prepare the armory for the inaugural ball, which will follow the governor's reception in the mansion tomorrow night. Such a vast number of tickets for the hall have been distributed that the committee decided today to, to transmit the music of Wayne King and Eddie Duchin from the armory across the street to the State House where the overflow crowd will dance in the long corridors on the first and second floors. Governor-elect Dwight H. Green went to Springfield yesterday for his inauguration today, leaving Republicans in Chicago still in the dark on his cabinet choices. Green and his party, including Mrs. Green and their two daughters and Republican leaders and personal associates, received a rousing send-off at the Union Station as they boarded a private car on the Abraham Lincoln. The incoming governor dropped no hints of his decision in the selection of State Department heads, and his advisors said they were not certain whom he would name. It was said Green might not complete the list of cabinet members for several weeks. Springfield, Illinois, January 12th. The $35 million a year Illinois paving industry is looking forward to the inauguration of Dwight H. Green as governor here tomorrow with more than idle curiosity. On the sidelines are contractors, material men, and insurance men watching a new pitcher warm-up uh, for the game they have played through both Republican and Democratic administrations. They don't know much about Green's arm except that as a federal prosecutor, he helped strike out Al Capone. We always got by in the past, uh, said a contractor, 
bolstering his optimism in the St. Nicholas Hotel bar this afternoon, so I suppose we'll get by okay in the future. There'll probably be some changes, said another contractor. Julius Caesar had to take care of some friends when he built the Roman roads. But I guess we know the game well enough that we can continue to play. Did you say play or pay, a companion asked. Indianapolis, Indiana, January 12th. Howard H. Mayer, chairman of the American Legion's Indiana Committee on Un-American Activities, urged today that the Indiana legislature lose no time in getting to the bottom of the alien voter charges made in a petition expected to be filed this week to contest the election of Henry F. Stricker, Democrat, as governor. Former Judge Virgil E. Whitaker of Hammond has presented ad advanced copies of the petition to legislative leaders. Tomorrow night in a meeting here, the Republican State Central Committee will hear Whitaker and inspect his evidence. The committee will decide whether to support the contest in, uh, the contest in an attempt to, to seat Glenn R. Hillis, Republican, as governor. Uh, uh, Stricker who has already been certified as the winner by the Secretary of State, will be inaugurated tomorrow. General, General Robert E. Wood, National Chairman of the America First Committee, called last night upon William Allen White to join with the committee in uncompromising opposition to President Roosevelt's War Powers Bill. In a telegram to, Emporia, to the Emporia, Kansas editor, who resigned as chairman of the Committee to Defend America by, a, a, by aiding the Allies, he is now honorary chairman, in protest against the activities of warmongers in the organization, General Wood asserted that the bill would destroy our Republican form of government and make the president a dictator with power to override every law on the statute books and take us into war whenever he saw fit. By, very, by uh, various of your statements, General Wood said to White, you have shown yourself sincerely opposed to our entry into war. Will you join with us in uncompromising opposition to it or to any other suggestion that the American people can no longer govern themselves? James Jenkins, chairman of the labor division of the Sh Chicago chapter of the America First Committee, warned that American labor faces certain regimentation in the event the president's dictatorial bill is passed and the United States goes to war. Jenkins joined in urging citizens to send a deluge of protest letters to Illinois senators and representatives in Congress to help defeat what he termed an approach to totalitarianism. He said passage of the bill would lead to war. Charlestown, Indiana, January 12th. A fast-moving drama in the national defense effort is being enacted here at the Indiana Ordnance Worksite, where 16,000 picked workers are racing against time to build a government plant that will make 600,000 rounds of smokeless powder a day. So rapid is the pace of construction that truckloads on the 5,000-acre tract charge overnight. Stacks and piles of materials vanish in one place and appear in another daily, and motorists driving past the fenced and guarded plant can observe progress from day to day. About 450 buildings, including powder-making facilities, warehouses, and shops are to be built. Included will be six lines of production, each a self-contained unit for making smokeless powder. The original project covered two such lines of production, each with a capacity of 100,000 pounds a day. These two may be ready to begin production by May, according to Army officials who are supervising the work of the private contractor. The other four lines contracted for, uh, contracted for later will add 400,000 pounds to daily capacity and will raise the total cost to $74 million. That figure does not include a powder bag loading plant to be built nearby as a, at a cost of $15 million to $18 million. E.I. DuPont de Nemours and Company Incorporated, the chemical company, is building the smokeless powder plant for the government. The uh, company will operate the works, but ownership will be held by the government. When construction reaches its peak, about 20,000 men will be at work. About 8,000 persons will be required to operate the plant. Peak production will be maintained for at least five years, Army officials said. None would guess whether the plant would be closed after that. Work is being pushed on the plant in eight-hour shifts, which stretch, around, uh, stretch all around the clock. Employees work six days a week and are paid at the time and a half overtime for the sixth day. 
Wages are paid at prevailing rates as determined by the Federal Department of Labor. DuPont does not divulge the rates, but individual worker statements indicated a common laborer receives $0.60 cents an hour. Carpenters, uh, $1.31 and one quarter cents, and uh, bricklayers, $1.50. Some other types of skilled workers receive more than the carpenters or bricklayers. Railroad yards are being built. Long strings of Baltimore and Ohio railroad passenger cars stand on sidings waiting to carry workers nonstop to, to uh, Jeffersonville, 12 miles south of Charlestown on the river opposite Louisville, or to Louisville itself. Buses of newly established, li established lines have been assigned a parking place inside the plant where about 2,400 automobiles of workers are packed at all hours. Guard rules are rigid. Visitors must fill out detailed records and submit satisfactory ident identification cards and are accompanied about the temporary corrugated metal administrative ad administration quarters by runners. Tours of the site are not permitted except on instructions from the War Department at Washington, D.C. Workers must present identification badges to every guard they pass and are called upon twice daily in, in the field to identify themselves. Family and public cemeteries which lie inside the plant area are being marked off by white, by white picket fences and are left undisturbed. But the Clark County Asylum for the Aged and Infirm south of Charlestown has been purchased for the project for $90,000. Meantime, the process of clearing out farmers on, adjacent, on the adjacent site of the bag loading plant is about to get underway. That project, called the Hoosier Ordinance Work, Works will take the 393 acre farm of William Carr Lentz, crowned International Corn King in Chicago in 1935. His land, owned by the family for 75 years, is said to have the highest AAA rating in Clark County. A subsidiary of Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company will build the bag loading plant where 3,500 workers, most of them women, will pack powder bags for, th for big guns. The Charlestown Powder Making Plant is located strategically in relation to Fort Knox, Kentucky and several other military establishments in the Louisville area. Aviation leaders yesterday outlined eight projects which they consider of first importance in helping Chicago to forge ahead as an air center during 1941. The leaders, manufacturers, airline presidents, engineers, and operators of flying schools said accomplishment of the following goals would be of far-reaching benefit to the city and the industry. Finish the Chicago Airport Enlargement Program, including removal of railroad tracks and installation of new lighting facilities. This program, progress progressing rapidly, will be completed within a year. Number two. Build the proposed new $1,813,000 airport terminal building to provide Chicago and the eight airlines serving the city with a modern depot commen commensurate in capacity and utility with existing air business and future expansion. Number three, begin a study of aviation fields in the metropolitan area as a basis for a long-term plan for alternate and multiple commercial airports for private flying, which soon will be comparable in importance to motoring and will create similar traffic problems and for airport manufacturing facilities here to throw neglected. Four, negotiate airport leases on modern long-range schedules with terms favorable to those offered by other large cities, particularly in New York, Los Angeles, and Kansas City. Number five, Renew efforts to attract headquarters of airline operators to Chicago, which geographically and economically is the logical location for such offices. Although eight airlines are serving Chicagoans, only one, United Airlines, has national headquarters here. Number six, build a high-speed highway from the loop to the airport at 63rd Street and Cicero Avenue. This could be a unit in a citywide plan of superhighways. Number seven, adopt a fostering attitude toward aviation so airplane and engine manufacturers and airline operators can proceed with assurance on building programs, including new hangars at Chicago Airport and new factory plants for this region. And number eight, create a civic agency to provide a channel for the peaceful settlement of labor relations problems. An important point in, uh, is the understanding that prosperity depends Upon the sweat and works and I will of all, uh, said W.A. Patterson, president of United Airlines. It's the old one for all and all for one idea. 
What's good for Chicago is good for the least important citizen as well as the most important one. Building a city is like building a business. Citizens must pull together. I firmly believe in Chicago's future. I believe this city and will uh, can and will be as important in the air transportation industry as it is in the railroad industry. We have established our offices here and are about to proceed with construction of another $400,000 office building and a $600,000 hangar. Representative Charles S. Dewey, newly, ele newly elected member of Congress from the 9th Illinois District, will be the guest of honor Thursday night at a dinner in the Chicago Athletic Club sponsored by business and civic leaders at the dinner. Uh, at the dinner, Dewey will summarize results of his interviews with federal officials in an effort to obtain a larger share of national defense expansions for Chicago. Ben Reagan investment banker and one of the sponsors of the dinner said Dewey had been invited because he is the only man in Congress fighting to make Chicago an aviation center. Chicago district orders were topped last week by a national defense contract awarded by the Studebaker Corporation for $33,657,580 in airplane engines. Precision parts for the air for the engines in an undisclosed amount are to be built in a plant to be erected by Studebaker in Chicago. Other awards for defense materials given companies in the Chicago region totaled approximately $3,426,000. Contracts awarded either by the Army or Navy included Barco Manufacturing Company Portable Gas Hammers $394,542. American Automatic Electric Sales Company Telephone Central Office Equipment, $259,038. J. Klein & Son Iron and Steel Pipe, $370,390. International Harvester Company Three Orders Tractor Parts, $103,599. Diesel Tractors and Parts, $261,771. And Artillery and Ammunition, $108,000. Skiaki Corporation Welding Machines, $89,770. A physical conditioning course for men expecting a selective service call within the next 18 months will be inaugurated tonight in Bartlett Gymnasium at the University of Chicago. The course is sponsored by the university's Department of Physical Education will be limited to 100 men. Students, alumni, faculty members, and residents of the university district are eligible for enrollment. The curriculum will include self-defense instruction, boxing, wrestling, jujitsu, combat games, swimming, safety, and uh, first aid, as well as competition in basketball, handball, volleyball, hiking, running, jumping, and climbing practice. The Chicago area contributed 123 new sailors last week, the Navy recruiting station announced. After six weeks pre-military training at the Great Lakes Naval Training Station, the men will be assigned to Navy trade schools or to ships. A Chicagoan, Walter Perkins, 27 years old, 1020 Lawrence Avenue, was among 55 flying cadets graduated Saturday as the second class to leave the nation's first bombardier instructor school at Lowry Field, Denver, Colorado. Under War Department regulations, cadets must serve a minimum of nine months before being given commissions as second lieutenants and assigned to duty with bombardment groups at any Army air schools throughout the country. Perkins attended Sen High School and Michigan State College. Judge Harry M. Fisher said yesterday that judges of the circuit court who refused last week to, to authorize employment of 42 persons in a special tax collection bureau may reconsider their, their decision if they have assurance the new, new bureau will not be an empty gesture in collecting delinquent taxes. There will be further conferences between judges and supporters of the plan, he said. If the judges are convinced the Bureau will be effective and if they have any assurances of cooperation from the county treasurer, the state's attorney, the sheriff, and other officials, they probably will consent to hiring the additional workers. Establishment of the Bureau to collect nearly a half billion dollars in unpaid taxes has been recommended by the Association of Commerce as a means of solving the financial, financial dilemma in which the county and other local governments find themselves. 
Establishment of the Taxpayers Federation of Illinois, an organization pledged to check the spending of the Illinois state and local governments and work for lower taxes, was announced yesterday. The announcement was accompanied by a warning from Sewell Avery, president of Montgomery Ward and Company, that taxpayers must take steps for their own protection against tax spending. Avery, one of the executives of nine large Chicago business institutions who have been chosen members of the Federation's board trustees, said there exists in Illinois today the acute need for the protection of the taxpayers' interests. Illinois state and local government or governmental expenditures in 1940 will surpass the un unprecedented total of $600 million. This amount represents a 70% increase compared with the year 1933. Peter Nalrot, 52 years old, 1943 Evergreen Avenue, a window washer, died last night in St. Elizabeth's Hospital after he had been shot by August Reinbant, 46, during a quarrel in a tavern at 2038 North Avenue. Rybant, who said he lives at the headquarters of Pulaski Post of the uh, at the P headquarters of Pulaski Post of the American Legion at 1558 North Hoyne Avenue, surrendered to North Avenue Police. He said he and Norrot, who was a sergeant of arms at the Legion Post, had quarreled. An ex-convict, said by police to be a member of a gang rounded up here last summer, was brought back from Kansas City, Missouri yesterday after he had waived extradition. He is Fred Gurney, alias Fred Bukowski, 43 years old, whose home is in Kansas City. Lieutenant Karan Phelan, head of the robbery detail, said Gurney had admitted taking part in the $400 robbery of Pulaski Council Security Association, 1062 North Ashland Avenue, last summer, and that he was involved in other robberies. The others of the gang, all indicted in August as robbers, included Mo Factor, age 53, of 4526 Sheridan Road, Richard Smith, 43 of 2849 North, uh, North Racine Avenue, Clarence Hawkins, age 41 of 11, West Division Street, and Arthur McQuanny, age 36 of 8728 Morgan Street, uh, Montgomery Hall, age 34 of 2924 North Linder Avenue, and Theodore Nash, 39 of 1118 North State Street. The first four named also are ex-convicts. And in sports... The largest crowd in hockey's history, 19,386 paid. Last night saw the Blackhawks administer a 2-1 licking to the able and heretofore very tough Detroit Red Wings. The gathering, which topped the former world record of 18,496 set in the stadium in the Stanley Cup game between the Hawks and the Toronto Maple Leafs on April 10, 1938, saw no expected murder or mayhem, not even a fight involving wing defenseman Giacomo Orlando or his lovable manager Jack Adams, but the customers got their money's worth plus in hockey. Orlando, whose attack on a spectator and other violence in the course of his buildup as the unwashed ogre of the blue lines and the last of hockey's bad men, was as meek as a pussycat throughout even after he had been plunked several times on the seat of his red drawers. In the first 30 seconds of play, Giacomo drew his first penalty in four games since he won berserk here on January 1st. But it was not for a violent offense. Simply, uh, simply gave the customers a chance for their first hollering. Moreover, the young man was smoothly shaven and his neck glistened. It was that scrubbed. A goal by Bob Kars on assist by Joe Cooper and Johnny Chad in the second period tied the score. Bill Toms drove home the winning counter with less than four minutes of the regular time to go in 1640 of the third period to be exact. Bob Kars and Chad assisted on this one. The victory brought to an end the wing string of eight contests without a defeat and also terminated a run of four straight victories for the Wings over the Hawks this season. More important, it gave the Hawks a record of one tie and three straight triumphs against rookie goalie Sammy Lopresti uh, since uh, rookie goalie Sammy Lopresti joined the team. After Orlando had been put off in the first minute of play, the Hawks attempted to execute a power play, but their technique left something to be desired. Some three minutes later, however, the Wings demonstrated how a power play should be developed, and for a while thereafter, it appeared the Hawks might be in a line for their fifth straight spanking by Detroit. 
Must March was locked up for slashing, and the Wings promptly started bearing down. The Hawks, uh, the Hawks stood off a couple of surges, but a half minute before March had served his term, Alex Motter, Sid Abel, and Carl Lescombe got possession of the puck. Abel and Lescombe passed backward and forward not far from their left boards until Motter got into scoring position. The rubber was slipped to him, and Alex banged it home from about a dozen feet out. The Hawks tying the score in the second period like uh, like the marker the uh, Wings made in the first period, was accomplished while the opposition was a man short. Joe Fisher had been put off by uh, put off for slashing Coley Dahlstrom. The Hawks maneuvered in the Detroit defense zone until Chad got a chance to pass to Cooper, stationed on his right boards, 10 feet inside the blue line. Joe made a long pass toward the cage. Goalie Johnny Mowers dropped on the ice to save Cooper's long sliding shot, whereby Bob Kars, who had charged to the mouth of the cage, picked up the puck and lifted it over the sprawled goalie, a perfect stick manipulation. The time was 8.32 of the second period. Later in the session, Bill Kars was put off for holding, and Art Wiebe got a layoff for a similar offense. The Wings bore down furiously during the spans. The Hawks were short of full force, but the Chicagoans fought hard, and the period ended 1-1. Toms had plenty to do in the production of the victory's victory goal. He was in. He was the center in a face-off uh, near the Detroit cage and stopped the puck with his skates. Then he shoved it into the melee precipitated by Chad and Bob Kars. Then he took the puck on a short pass from Chad and shot past Mowers for the payoff. New York, January 12th. The New York Rangers tonight defeated the New York Americans 3-1 before 12,534 in Madison Square Garden. Boston, Massachusetts, January 12th. The Boston Bruins extended their undefeated string to eight games tonight by coming from behind for a 7-5 National Hockey League victory over the Montreal Canadiens before 12,000. Well, let's take a look at the hockey standings right now. While the Toronto Maple Leafs are in first place, they have won 17, lost 7, and tied 1 for 35 points. The Detroit Red Wings are in second place. They have won 12, lost 7, 7 ties, a lot of ties there, for 31 points. The uh, Boston Bruins are uh, 10 and 7 and 7 for 27 points. The Chicago Blackhawks are 10 and 10 and 5 for 25 points. The New York Rangers are 9 and 12 and 5 for 23 points. The New York Americans are 6 and 14 and 7 for 19 points. And the Montreal Canadiens taking up the rear are 8 and 15 and 2 for 18 points. The Hammond Caesars uh, sparked by Little Clem Rue, who, R-U-H, Rue, <laughs> who scored 16 points yesterday, ended a 21-game winning streak of the Oshkosh All-Stars with a 43-32 triumph in the Hammond Civic Center. Oshkosh won eight straight games in the National Basketball League, plus 13 exhibition games. Hammond used a fast break to roll up a 15-4 lead in the first quarter and survived an Oshkosh spurt in the second period to retain, retain a 21-16 edge at the half. Ships two baskets and another by Burl, or Barrel, B-A-R-L-E, gave Oshkosh a 23-23 tie midway through the third quarter, but Ruz, one hand shot and two baskets by Dar Hutchins, former Bradley Starr, gave Hammond a 30-25 lead that was strengthened as the game wore on. Ru and his further, former Southern California teammate Ralph Vaughn led Hammond's attack while Barrel with five baskets, was high for Oshkosh. Cowboy Edwards of Oshkosh, individual scoring champion for three successive seasons, was held to five points. Well, let's take a look at the uh, National Basketball League standings, uh, which is not always published in the, uh, in the newspaper for some odd reason. And uh, it's very rare that they publish a game other than the Chicago Bruins. So it was kind of a treat to read about another team. Oh, by the way, the uh, Akron Firestones defeated Detroit, uh, whatever their team name is, 48-42. Uh, to 42. All right, now let's take a look at the standings. Uh, Oshkosh is 8-1. Uh, and one. They are in first place. Sheboygan is 7-5. and five. Uh, Goodyear is, uh, they're from Akron. Uh, they are six and seven. Chicago is four and five. 
Hammond is 5 and 7, Detroit is 4 and 6, and also from uh, Akron, the Firestones are uh, 4 and 7. Jacksonville, Florida, January 12th. Larry Moon Mullins, one of Notre Dame's greats, and Orville Dermati, a former star at Loyola of Los Angeles, were named today to fill the vacancies on the University of Florida football coaching staff. Dr. John T. Tigert, university president, announced. Mullins was head coach at St. Ambrose College in Davenport, Iowa last season, producing an undefeated unscored upon 11 in his first year. While definite assignments were not announced, it was believed Mullins will take over the backfield coaching position and that Dermotti would handle the ends. Mullins and Dermotti were given two-year contracts. Mullins was also made a professor of physical education and Dermotti an assistant professor. Florida's head football coach is Tom Lieb, former Notre Dame line coach. And that is sports and that is news as read from the Chicago Tribune for Monday, January 13th, 1941. Have a swell day.